Well, I'm grateful you've joined us this morning. Good morning. My name is Dennis, and today we kick off our new teaching series entitled, Get in the Game. And over the next four weeks, we're going to encourage one another to get off the bench, to come down from the stands, to get off the sidelines and get onto the field, get onto the court and play the game. And so good morning. I'm super glad that we're here. That was a crazy beginning, wasn't it? I love that. I said to someone, that's what happens when you put the middle school pastor in charge. (laughs) And then someone said, wow, Dennis, you're taking a chance today by wearing a ref shirt. You're looking forward to all kinds of criticism, well, perhaps today, but it's good to see you. It's good to see you smile today. This whole series will have a sports theme, but we're going to dig very deep into the word every week and see how we're to play as a team together. And that's the theme for today, team, the importance of team, teamwork makes the dream work. Now, before that we jump into the book of Acts, and I'll tell you about a great team, let's have a little fun here regarding teams. Think back to your favorite team, perhaps growing up, and I'm thinking about sports, but maybe it was another team. What comes to mind? Go ahead and just maybe share that with your neighbor. If you don't know them, introduce yourself real quick. Any favorite teams that come to mind, go ahead and put that in the chat if you're worshiping with us online. Go ahead. Favorite teams. Okay, a lot of activity today. Good stuff. All right, come on back, come on back. I've got a message to declare. Well, for me, it's so easy to go back to childhood. And so the team that comes to mind was the 1975-76 World Series champion, the Cincinnati Reds, right? The big red machine. Okay. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, Joe Morgan, George Foster, Ken Griffey Sr., right? Tony Perez. Now, who was the manager? Sparky Anderson. Yeah, you're right. Another team that comes to mind is the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team that won the gold. I was in fifth grade. I'll never forget sitting with my dad, listening. Do you believe in miracles? What a team. And then a little later on, who would say the 2014 national champions football Ohio State Buckeyes? Yeah, that was a great team. (laughs) And now I know we have a lot of different fans in the room here today, but I want to say in two weeks, I hope to say the 2023 Super Bowl champs, the Cincinnati Bengals. (laughs) And there may be some other fans in here from other places, but I'm saying amen to that as well. So, yeah. Yeah. This is a lively crowd today. I like it. (laughs) I grew up playing sports. I loved being part of a team. I was never a standout like some of you, but I always enjoyed. And those stories are getting brighter and bigger. I remember when I was in middle school, I was playing for Duncan Falls Junior High football, and I was an inside linebacker. Can you tell? (laughs) And uh, just a little skinny kid. But uh, my buddy who's probably watching today, Dwayne Sears, I think he was a defensive tackle on that team. But we were playing the Sheridan Generals at high school in Eastern Ohio. And the quarterback went back and threw it right to me. <laughs> and I intercepted it. I mean, it's like, well, wait a minute, I got the ball. And that was a highlight because it was a highlight because my grandfather, it was the only game that I can remember him ever attending, um, see me play. I think that was the end of my football career, but I went on to play basketball in high school and soccer and fun things. So perhaps you were part of a team. Anybody part of a band growing up? So a lot of, yeah. There's an enthusiastic band member down front there. That's the preacher's (laughs) wife. (laughs) She was part of UK marching band. And so she understands, like many of you, the importance of teamwork in a band. But let me also say that I've been part of no greater team than this team, this team here at Gigginsburg, God's team, because what we're doing here matters for all of eternity. It really matters. And the apostle Paul discovered that as well. So you have your Bibles or Bible app. I want to invite you to turn with me into the New Testament to the book of Acts. 
the history of the church. If you're looking for that, go to the New Testament, the Gospels, good news, that's what the word gospel means, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the next book is Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, but really it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And here we find, by the time we reach the 16th chapter, that Paul is traveling and ministering in what we would know today as the land of Turkey, the country of Turkey, which during the first century was a Roman providence named Asia Minor. He was ministering the good news. This was his second missionary journey. Many churches were being strengthened, but he had reached a point that he was finding closed doors. And he was discerning with the others where to go. He is with Silas, and he is with, as far as we know, Luke, Dr. Luke, who's writing this account. And in verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions, meaning his teammates, traveled. And so they were traveling through this region. But they were finding doors shut. Now look with me to Acts chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so they are in Asia Minor, in the city of Troas, on the coast of the Aegean Sea, and he has this vision of a man in Europe across the Aegean, which would be modern-day Greece, Macedonia, the region of northeastern Greece, to come over across the straits to minister the gospel to them. Now look at the next verse. After Paul had seen the vision, what's the next word? We. we. Underline that. We. We. Now notice that Luke is not saying, or the writer's not saying Paul. He's saying we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called, what's the next word? Us. Us together to preach the gospel to them. Who was going to be preaching the gospel to the people of Macedonia? All of them, right? The team together. Yes, Paul often gets the credit. Silas gets the credit, but they were part of a band. They were part working together as a team together. They were traveling together. And so it says, we got ready. We prepared for what God wanted them to do. And that's what we're doing here. We come on Sunday morning. We're giving God praise. We're acknowledging this is the first day of the week. And before we do anything else, we're saying, God, this week is for you. And on the first day of the week, I set aside the first hours of the week to give you praise, to acknowledge that life in this week is not about me, but it's about you. And you are the Lord of the entire week, of all seven days. But on the first day of the week, as a person of the resurrection, being Raised in Christ, I give you my praise. But also we come during this teaching time of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and we're getting ready. We're prepared because we are saved to serve, to go out there. So as they were preparing, we're getting prepared. Now what was happening? They were getting ready to go over to Europe. God was opening the door to the European continent. What's God doing here? We're getting ready. Because God wants to take us to a land that we've never been before as individuals as well as corporately, together. And so what do we do? We're getting ready. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. You see, the truth is, together we're stronger. Often we find that all through life. Birds, when they're flying, they often fly together. Ever seen geese fly with that V? Why, why do they do that? They do that because it takes 40% less energy for them to fly. Now, they could fly solo. They could fly by themselves, no doubt. But they can go further and longer if they are flying in formation with one another. The same principle is true with us. All through the Bible, we see this little phrase, one another. Love one another. Encourage one another. 
Bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, comfort one another. You might be thinking, well, wow, it's Jesus and me. No. Yes, Jesus comes to us individually and we must come to him, but it's together that we live out this Christian life. You might be thinking, well, I'm strong enough. I'm talented enough. Well, here's the deal. You might be talented enough to do what you think that you should do, but you're not strong enough or talented enough to do what God has prepared for you to do. Amen? God's got something bigger for you. Don't settle for less. In fact, if you're struggling and trying to discern God's will, take a a few moments and go back to our last three messages, they're online, and you can go through those. We talked about trading good for great. God has something better if we only put ourselves in the river of God and allow the Holy Spirit, that flow of that river, to take us to a place that we never thought or imagined. Jesus, when he launched the church, established a movement, and he did so with people. Now, Jesus could have done it all by himself, right? But instead, he went to a group of ordinary people, blue-collar workers, so to speak, just hard-working, sweater-your-brow, calloused hands kind of people that understood the importance of a good day of work. He went to fishermen, Peter, James, John, Andrew, who were out casting their nets, women who were workers, who were Wonderful people who empowered others and families of Mary, Magdalena, and Joanna, and others. And he went to these normal people, not the elites of the society, but just the ordinary Joes and Jennifers of this world. And he said, follow me. Now, he could have went to them, and he could have said, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, God loves you. And that would be true. God loved them. But he went for much more than the power of positive thinking. Amen? He actually called them to do something. He said, follow me. And the Bible says in the gospel, immediately they dropped their nets. They gave up their business, actually. And they followed Jesus. Jesus could have done it all by himself, but he mobilized a team around him. And then those people went out later after the resurrection and they changed the world in Jesus' name. Everyone here has a part to play. How good is a band if there are only three people really taking it serious and the rest it's chaos out there? Those perfect formations you see in the best band in the land, so to speak, or another band, it's because they're working together as a team. Everyone is vital. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 to 20. Actually, the whole chapter, and go ahead and read it. He's talking about how we are part of Christ's body. We can't divorce ourselves from one another. And then he compares it to body parts. And he writes these words, starting at verse 14. He says, yes, the body has many different parts, just not one. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not the hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not the eye, would that make it any less part of the body? So he's just using um, pretty common logic here, right? And he goes on, if the whole body were an eye, how could you hear? And if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many different parts, and God has put each part just as he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. All, and he wraps it up this way, of you together are Christ's body, and each of you are a part of it. All of you are Christ's body. Sisters and brothers, this is a one another thing here today. Amen? This is a community. You can't divorce yourself 
from your sister or brother. You can try, but there's really no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Because the truth is, although we come in a very personal way to Jesus, we come to the place where we're yoked together. And even we read the scripture, we cannot say that we love God and hate our sister or brother. And so that's why we gather here, because we encourage one another. We support one another. We bear one another's burdens. Even in the hallway today, I was talking to people, and I was talking about how was your week, and I was talking, they were asking me about mine, and we were encouraging one another. Let me say a word to those who are part of our online campus, part of our online community. And last week, just after Sunday morning, or during Sunday morning, we had, I think, around 600 people that were glad that you're here, and you are part of our church. You are in community. But being online, and online, great. It's all great in many different ways. It's great like last week when the snow is pounding. We can't get here, but we can go online. It's great when uh, we're homebound for our shut-ins. It's great when we're traveling on, on vacation. It's great for many different ways to make up if, if we miss. It's great. But let me just say this. Online church must be much more than just watching a show. Okay? It's much more than just getting a message, learning something. That's informational. Doesn't automatically mean that's transformational. It's much more than just hearing a song. Online must be active. Online must be community. So I want to invite you as you're online, just like I'm in challenging all of you here in this room today, to enter into the chat, begin to talk, if you are homebound, you still can be very, very active in the church. If you're online now, that means you can be online during the week. And I want to invite you to get part of Ginsburg Praise. That's one of our uh, Facebook pages where people are bearing one another's burdens. Ginsburg Praise. And you can intercede for others. You can pray for your staff. You can pray and encourage all those requests that are coming in. Another way that you can be part of online is join our discord that we have. Gingsburg Discord with Dominique Lamb and others who are sharing about life and different topics of faith. Or join the Bible in a year. We have several dozen people, I believe, participating right now in our Bible app with Nikki Gumbel reading through the Bible in one year. Whether you're here or whether you're online, I want to invite you to participate in that. What I'm trying to say is that you are an important part of the body of Christ. Don't go 30 years and live in the shadows. Amen? Come out of the shadows and come into community, in-house or online. Let me say another word to those who live out of state. First of all, thank you for joining us. We have several people who join us every week who get a teaching, some who are formerly members here and others who just connected. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining. And you can be part of that community too. But if you're online, I'm going to say a, a pastoral word, at least from my heart. Others may have a different view. I want to encourage you. If you live out of state, even though you continue to listen to these messages and you connect here, I want to encourage you to find a local ministry where you can connect with, where you can be known, where iron sharpens iron, that you can get involved in mission and people can know who you are in your local area, that you can be light into your community in which you live. Don't let this be a substitute for hands-on ministry. Don't let it be. Now, I know that coming out is risky because you have to get up early. You have to make an effort to get dressed. It may be your day off. Sometimes it's hard if you have kids. It takes a little effort. But I want to say that no matter what we give, just know that God will give so much more. Amen? Amen? That God will bless when we give. It's not a give to get, but God just has a way. Now, let me say one other thing, and I'm going to move on. 
Another secret is that when you connect to a good Bible-based church in another area, don't compare that church with this church, okay? God's called that church for a unique time in a neat community. And the truth is that that church may not have as good looking senior pastor as this church, <laughs> right? At least that's what my wife thinks, I hope. <laughs> You're awake. The blessing is in the obedience, amen. The truth is we need each other. Did you notice, if you listen closely, the beginning with Jaden, that was midnight stars, no parking on the dance floor from 1983 in the background. The truth is no wallflowers in the church. All of us are called in some way to get off the wall and on to the dance floor. And over the next four weeks, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about and having fun doing it. To come down out of the stands, no armchair quarterbacks, get onto the field, get off the bench and play the game. It's one thing even to come and have praise. But we at Ginsburg have said, yes, we give God the glory. And one way that we praise and worship is by our very lives. We love Jesus and we what? Do something about it. We are called not just to have energy, because you can have energy without ethics. Amen? Think about that. We can come in here and do cartwheels and praise God and go home and never really do anything for Jesus. We're called to, to take someone's hand, to link arms with one another, and to bring the light of Christ into the world. We know that we have so much potential for those who are football fans, just reminder here in Ohio, Joe Burrow sat on the bench for three years at Ohio State. Yes, until he transferred to LSU. So there's potential on the bench. There's some singers, gifted singers that are not using their talents. There are people that work with children. You're gifted and God's called you to that, but still, and God's calling you to a new day. Well, I'm going to just share, we're focusing on sports, and I know that we have fans from different things, but I want, this is a good illustration. I want to share a little bit. I know there's a big game today, and I want to share a little bit about uh, Joe Burrow since he's so well known and make some connections here. So quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, most of us know that he is from Athens, Ohio, actually the Plains, which is right outside of Athens. What you may or may not know is that I lived and worked in Athens in, in the Plains for seven years. Um, my office, the Foothills District Methodist office, was right across the street from Athens High School and actually exactly right across the street from the high school football stadium that's been renamed Joe Burrow Stadium. And they used our parking lot as an overflow for the stadium. And so I'd go to work and I'd see the team out there. And when I came on the district, uh, Joe was in high school. Everybody called him Joey. And um, he just actually came from a very... Um, common place, a pretty normal house. He lived two, I know exactly where his parents lived, two houses down from the Methodist parsonage in town. And, and so Joey was very, very well known. He was a great athlete, but he was also very involved with his folks in the community. The Cleveland Plain Dealer, after he received the Heisman, wrote about his involvement in Athens in the Plains and said some things about serving that I want you to hear. He said this, it was Burrow who would take time to the high school, who would take time to sit with the so-called unpopular students in the cafeteria. He would also walk with the special needs students to and from class, the same students who would cheer him on during his football and basketball games. It was also Burrow in high school who would lead his teammates outside after their weekly Saturday morning breakfast at the Athens Bob Evans to donate their spare change to the homeless who would gather down under the underpass of U.S. Ohio 33. Adam Luberman went to play on at Ohio University in the position of tight end, said this, I remember during our junior year of high school when we went to Bob Evans and it was freezing. There was a homeless man on the side of the road and Joe took note of that. He then went back and ordered a meal to go and gave it to that man. He said, I'll never forget this. Now, parents, here's what I want you to hear. Values are more caught 
than taught. Write that down in your mind. Values are more caught than taught. You can teach all you want, but if you live a different way at home, they're watching, they're observing. And one of the things that uh, Joey learned was from his parents, and the, the dealer went on this, plain dealer, this sense of mission was instilled in Joey by his parents. Jimmy Burrow, retired defensive coordinator at Ohio University last February, volunteered at the concession stand at the high school games. Robin Burrow, principal at Eastern Local Elementary, which is one of our elementary schools down there, often volunteers her time in the community. She once stepped up when the school food pantry didn't have enough Thanksgiving turkeys, which the school food bank provides to needy area families within the district. So that's their new path down there. Quote, we were short one Thanksgiving, Kim Goldsberry, Athens City School District President, and I saw Robin at Kroger's in Athens. And she asked what I'm doing with a cart full of turkeys, milk, and eggs. I tell her we ran out of food and people are waiting in need. I get to the register and she hands me money. That's the kind of people they are. It's no wonder why Joey turned out the way he did. Well, we're here today not because of football. We're using this as a launching pad, as a theme. And we're here not to simply highlight a sports star, but we are here today to talk about the bright morning star. We're here today to talk about Jesus. We're here today to talk about God's team, this great team together in which we're called to be the church together. And so let's go back now to Acts 16 as we wrap things up. Paul and Silas and Luke and others, this great team, Paul and his companions, they make their way across the Aegean and they make their way to Macedonia and they travel inland about 10 miles to the Roman colony of Philippi. It was a day of prayer, the Bible says, and there was a woman sitting by the river and she was praying. Paul witnessed to her. She came to faith in Christ Her name was Lydia. She owned a business and she was baptized, the first convert to Christianity that we know of, at least in record, in the book of Acts. And then she provided housing for the team. Paul and Silas went on. They began ministering, a healing to others in need, the healing power of Jesus. There was a girl who was possessed. She was a slave. And people were making money off of her by her prophesying. And Paul and Silas prayed for her, and she was healed and delivered and couldn't prophesy anymore. Well, of course, this made the slave owners very upset. And so they started a riot, and Paul and Silas were thrown in jail. And the Bible says in Acts 16, as they were in jail at midnight, they were singing praises to God. What happened? An earthquake came upon the land and the doors of the prison fell apart. They were all free. The jailer, quite upset that on his watch, the prisoners were set free, knowing the law declared that if prisoners would escape, that he would probably lose his life because they were on his watch. He was ready to kill himself. He was ready to give up on life. But Paul spoke to him. This is verse 28. Check this out. He says this, but Paul shouted. I wish I could shout. I wish I had one of those preacher voices that could really shout. (laughs) You got this voice. I'm sorry. (laughs) Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We, we, we are all here. I love that. We haven't, don't kill yourself. Don't give up on life. There's hope. We haven't abandoned. We haven't left. We are all here. And what did he say? He said, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your household. And right there, they had a baptismal service for this man and his entire 
household. Hallelujah. That's the reason he went to Europe, friends. And the church began there. Now, as we close today, I'm just amazed by that prayer. And it's my prayer that we would shout, that we as Kingsburg would shout this month, that we would shout to Tip City, that we would shout to Dayton, that we would shout to Miami County, to Shelby County, that we would shout to Dark County, that we would shout to Clark County. Don't lose your life. Don't take your life. Don't give up on life. We're all here. We're here. We're here to serve. We haven't given up on you. Don't you give up on God. We're all here. We're staying in the game. We're getting on the court. We're on the playing field. We're all here. My friends, we shout to serve. Amen? Amen. We shout to bear one another's burdens. We shout to wash other people's feet. Let's shout for Jesus. God's not through with us. He's taking us into a land that we've never been before. Just like Paul and Silas and Luke and the team to a place they'd never been before. And they shouted a message of hope. One way that we can do that in a very practical way, this is kind of the older call, is actually love Jesus and do something about it. You can even today, after this service, go online to ginghamsburg.org slash serve. And over the next several weeks, we're going to make that very clear areas that you can find your place in this place and plug in. You can be a vital team. Hey, you join the team. Why don't you play? Now, before we leave, and I promise this is the last thing, somebody might be thinking, well, I don't even know if I'm part of this team yet. In a way, you're saying the same question at the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Because God's word says in John chapter 1, for as many as received him, to them he gave the rights to become the children of God for those who believe in his name. Today, you can believe. You can be born anew. You can be born again by saying, Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I've done that have not been pleasing to you. And I surrender those things at the foot of the cross. And I ask God, by the power of your resurrected might, that you'll resurrect me in Christ Jesus today to a new life, that I might be part of that team. Oh Lord, I thank you today. If that's the desire of any heart here or watching online or worshiping online, may it be so today, that they may find you as Savior and Lord. And know that they are united into Christ's family, the body. And that you have a role for them to play. And I thank you for this team, this Kingsburg team. Imperfect, group of misfits, but redeemed and transformed by your love. Help us, Lord, to shout this week that all the world may hear that Jesus is Lord. For this we pray and believe in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. Amen. If you have been blessed by this video, feel free to comment on what spoke to you. Hit the like button and share this with a friend who needs encouragement today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on any of the latest videos. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.